morning. Uh, I'm here to introduce the speaker this morning um, and remind you of America's famous author and great lecturer, Mark Twain, known for his wealth, who refused to let anyone introduce him. In his autobiography, he says, introductions were so grossly flattering that they made me ashamed. And I began, and so I began my talk at a heavy disadvantage. It was an awkward custom. There was no occasion for the introduction. The introducer knew very little about me, and his prepared speech was a jumble of tawdry compliments and a dreary effort to be funny. Therefore, after the first few seasons, or the first season, in fact, it was a, uh, I used to give those wonderful world tours, including in India. After the first season, I always introduced myself. During the last few months, working with them in the midst of complex situations and a whirlwind of opinions, the speaker has consistently guided us back to the anchor of truth, urging us to stick to the facts, to be factual. That was his common refrain. It is in this spirit that I formally introduce the speaker of the day, Dr. Shailesh Shirali. Dr. Shailesh Shirali, a distinguished educator and mathematician, has dedicated over four decades of his life to making significant contributions to academia, educational leadership, and mathematics education in India. Hailing from Karnataka, his education journey began with a, a BSc in Physics Honors from Delhi University, followed by an MBA from the prestigious Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Driven by an unwavering passion for mathematics, he earned a PhD in Operations Research from the University of Texas. Integral to Dr. Shirali's educational journey is his enduring commitment to the teachings of J. Krishnamurti, a commitment spanning four decades with the Krishnamurti Foundation India, currently holding the esteemed position of Director of Sahaji School in Kovita, uh, Dr. Shirali continues to impart his wisdom in most in Krishnamurti's profound teachings. His association with Rishi Valley dates back to 1983, marking the beginning of his life's calling in Krishnamurti schools. Notably, he served as a principal at Rishi Valley from 1992 to 2004, receiving the prestigious National Award for Teachers in 2003 from the President of India, recognizing his exceptional contributions to education. Beyond administrative roles, Dr. Shirali has played a pivotal role in shaping mathematics education in India. In 1987, his involvement in the Mathematical Olympia movement underscores his dedication to nurturing mathematical talent. He not only trained Indian teams for the International Mathematics Olympia, but also authored numerous mathematics books for high school students. As the chief editor of At Right Angles, the magazine for school mathematics, published by the Asim Indian University in collaboration with the Community Mathematics Center, Rishi Valley, Dr. Shirali facilitates the dissemination of original observations and discoveries in mathematics. In addition, Dr. Shirali also serves as a council member of the Editor of Resonance, a premier journal for mathematics and science education in India, further contributing to the advancement of educational discourse in the country. Dr. Shirali's remarkable achievements underscores his commitment to holistic education, leaving an indelible mark on the educational landscape of India. I now request Dr. Shalani to take over. Thank you.
and introduce a few notions, a few themes. And of course, we will have a question and answer session at the end. I think we will ask difficult and uh, searching questions to open up the theme because that will help all of us. So I'm going to just describe briefly what I will do in today's talk. I'll start by talking briefly about the nature of change, some dimensions of change, and I'll bring in a little dose of history in that part of the presentation. It won't recur later. Following that, I'll talk a bit about the nature of division, what division implies, what it leads to, and its connection with some terms that came during the video on the second day. That is, words like separateness, separativeness, individuality, and so on. And following that, I'll talk briefly about cooperation, which happened to come up during the, the video screening yesterday. And I'll end with by talking about energy, which may seem a bit mysterious at this point, but I think that is perhaps the most important part of this exploration, because I think it contains something uh, of great importance to us. Sometime at, at that point, either at that point or maybe after the question and answer sessions, I would like to read out some extracts from Krishnamurti, slightly longish extracts, because I think they are highly relevant to our examination today. So I hope that is all right. We will take advantage of the fact that this is almost the last session, so we have a little bit of play in time available. So I have asked a question out there, what's the cause of division? That happens to be the question that was asked by Krishnaji in that first talk. And he said, can you apply your mind and actually find for yourself what is, what is the cause? So I'm going to ask about change to start with. What brings about change? And does change come about naturally? Of course it does. We all grow, we explore life, we bump into things, we make new friends. There are so many different things which happen in our life and it comes, you can call that a natural kind of a change and life keeps adapting to that. But not all change is of this kind. There are many changes which come about in a much more deliberate way because of our own motivations, because of the way we think, because of the way we, we want things from life. For example, they could come about because of our aggressiveness, our desire to conquer, our desire to possess. I'm going to give a few examples to this. These are all elements of our psyche and they have profound consequences on the world. They are whether you can call such changes as occurring naturally is a matter of, you know, we can discuss that. But there is an element of thought behind that. Our aggressiveness, our desire to possess, our acquisitiveness and so on. <coughs> or can the origins be in our demand for pleasure and entertainment, our desire to perhaps escape from ourselves? Can that bring about change? Or the theme of self-knowledge, which I am not going to develop very much in this talk. And it was done in great detail by Siddharth yesterday and also there, it was there in the video evening, in the evening last evening. So can change come about as a result of lack of self-knowledge? I think change can come about as a result of all these and such change has profound effects in the world quite different from the change that occurs naturally and easily and as part of the natural rhythm of life. Because I think it's a firm principle that, that when we have a certain motive in doing something in life, that motive leads, 
leaves its trace in life. It's not something which goes cleanly through life, leaving no trace behind it. There's a great deal of, of after effect. You know, there's a well known question of whether the means justify the end, which philosophers sometimes get into not so. It's obvious that the means are, are contained in the end. There's no such thing as the means separate from the end. And in a way, this question is related to that question as well. Because the manner in which change happens is going to influence what happens as a result of that change. So I would put here that all such change leads us deeper into illusion and further from reality, <coughs> further away from reality. And as such, it's going to have profound effects in, on life. So let's take an example from history. Now this particular slide has got examples from history. You have the Industrial Revolution and the colonial expansions which happened in the 18th and 19th century and the Industrial Revolution too. What was the motive behind this? The, well, you can put a, it's a whole complex of factors, you can't describe it as a single thing. But colonial expansion there was an expression of a tremendous desire to conquer, a desire for greed, a desire to possess lands which are far away. It's a very expansionist kind of a movement. And when you ally it, when you link it with in the Industrial Revolution, the results are, are very major. For example, let's take the opium wars which happened in, in China, which was basically a result of one country trying to bully another country into, into preserving its, uh, its, you know, offering its, uh, its markets and so on. Britain doing that to China. Or look at what happened to the East India Company or the East Dutch Company, which also was mentioned by Siddharth yesterday. You can call it economic imperialism and it contains uh, demand for raw materials, demand for captive markets, creation of a labor class is one of the consequences of that. And all these things result in consequences. A stark wealth gap, for example, in the countries where industries are put up. This is England in those at that time had immense wealth gap. There was the poor class and the rich class and the vast difference between them. One of the things that Gandhiji observed when he first went to the UK was exactly this. He went and met some of those workers and so on. A huge social divide comes about and maybe some uh, a huge phenomenon like communism is a direct result of that whole train of events. So you can see here an example of how a change which has come about through our own innate, our own inherent aggressiveness and our desire to possess, our desire to conquer, what it has resulted in. Think, you consider what it has done in India, for example, the result of the British coming to India, the consequences on our education system, what the influence of all the European nations has been on the African countries, perhaps even worse than what has happened in, in India, much worse in fact, and slavery and so on. All that is, is connected with this. Then let's look at a phenomenon like globalization, which is also connected with consumers. What has been the motive force behind this? Again, globalization is very much connected with the first thing of expansion. But there's another element which comes into this, which is consumerism, which is the tremendous desire to consume. And consume what? What are we consuming? What is the, the reason we want to consume endlessly, which is a phenomenon which is happening right now among us? It's not hard to see what the cause of that is. And we can see the consequences of that on the environment. It has led to such immense environmental collapse all over the world because our greed for, for materials, our greed for various kinds of substances all over the world has led to enormous exploitation. And this also results surprisingly in a phenomenon such as fundamentalism. And it is actually happening in many countries, for example, what happened in Iran. 
in the 1950s when uh, Iran was more or less, it had become a puppet of the US thanks to oil. Its whole society changed drastically because of this peculiar contact with the West, contact with Europe, the Western, uh, with America and with the Western European countries like France. And there was a huge change in the society which didn't go down well with whoever the traditional society there. And after a long and complicated series of events, it, it ended up in a whole revolution, fundamentalism, and you can see where the direction that Iran has gone in over the last 50 years or so. It is a bit, you can say, a direct consequence of some of these events which happened about 75 years back. So these events really go, you know, they travel far in time and space. Then you have the very well-known phenomenon of social media and the consequences of that, what you may call the Instagram generation, powerfully influenced by social media. And we, and we are all familiar with the consequences of that. Mental health issues, avenues of escape, creating virtual worlds which take us away from reality, extreme polarization as was referred to yesterday, hate circles, echo chambers where all you hear is your own voice and your own opinions reflected from others who think like you do. And where does this come from? What is the what is the motive behind social media? Where has it come from? Is it also part of the globalization and consumerism? What, what is the origin? Or is it desire for pleasure, desire for entertainment? So all these things result in tremendous consequences. And the latest one is of course artificial intelligence, chat GPT. Where does it come from? Does it come from scientific curiosity? Partly that, certainly. Does it come from a profit motive? From, and whatever it is, you can see that it is going to get allied to nationalism. It is going to get allied to the defense industry very soon. And that is another very dangerous uh, direction in which humanity is going to go when artificial intelligence gets into the armaments industry. Perhaps it is already happening in some places. So what is the response to this? Such change almost always leads to a redistribution of power and wealth. I think this is historically quite easy to see. It, it, almost always what happens when there is drastic change of this kind which comes in, a few people get access to tremendous resources and you get a redistribution of wealth. In some cases, it may not be a few a person; it may be a nation, which which has got got hold of some new technology, some new change, and then is bent on making use of it for to further its own nationalist agenda. And such change is cumulative in nature, so it's always adding to itself, and it obviously results in instability and insecurity. You can have, and there is some fallout which comes from it. It could be outward, resulting in wealth gaps, social tensions, ethnic tensions, communism as I pointed out a minute back, and nationalism, fundamentalism, fascism, threat of war. And then also in the inward, in the inner life, the inner world, disruption of one's personal life, children growing up too fast, a hardening of the psyche and the, one of the recent phenomena which you see all around the world is an obsession with identity, a very strong desire to identify with something or the other. We can you know, look at some of these in greater detail, like, you know, some, a phenomenon like fascism or a phenomenon like uh, they are talking of make, for example in America, make America great again. This theme is there in many different countries, make something great again. So you're thinking of some glorious past when your country was, or your whatever, was one of the top countries in the world, and now it has lost status. You're desperate to regain that status. And 
all the movements which start as a result of that. So, for example, what happened in Rome, in Italy about one century back is exactly that. People dreaming of the glory of the Roman Empire and so on, and trying to recreate that. And it has a message for us, obviously, at the present time. So all this is the response to change. When change happens, and let me repeat what I said at the beginning, there can be change which happens naturally. I think such change, perhaps, you know, yesterday during the video, Krishnamurti talked of right action, right action which leaves no, no regret, it leaves no guilt, it leaves no mark in fact, right action. And this is the exact opposite. It is change that has been brought about through a desire to possess, a desire to manipulate, a desire to take something from someone else which doesn't belong to you in the first place. And these things, they, they have immense consequences. Because when whole societies do them, one country to another, you know, immense number of people involved, these effects last not just you know, a few days or months, they last centuries. And you can see that happening all over the world right now. So there is this wonderfully stated natural law, which Krishnamurti has stated, where there is division, there is conflict. Now, how, what makes this true? What, why, is it, why do we call it a natural law? So, first of all, can we see uh, where this division comes from? I just jump on it. What creates division? It's all of the above. That means when you have inequalities created through change, inequalities of power, inequalities of wealth, inequalities of opportunity, which are created as a result of, of very rapid change, which the society is not able to absorb. So it, it's naturally going to create division between people, because you have one vested interest and another vested interest somewhere else. But I've asked out here, isn't it also the importance we give to the accident? Now this is an important notion which we need to absorb. The notion of the accident. I'll show you a beautiful quote from Krishnamurti in a couple of slides from now. But what is accident? Just think of how, how much of a consequence the accidental has in today's world. It could be referring to people, the accident of birth into a particular religion, or that being born into a particular family. It's all focused on the particular. The accident of being born into a, in a particular country, or into a particular caste, or the accident of being born with a particular talent. Have you noticed in society as it is constituted today, there's an immense premium being placed on talent. And as a result, your entire life can get shaped by a particular talent that you have. And the person who doesn't have that talent will never have this opportunity. Again, that question was considered in great detail by Krishnadi in yesterday's question and answer session. The very first question that he talked about when the theme was about injustice. So this is a kind of natural injustice which nobody can solve because it's part of life itself. But what happens is that we, we exploit this, this situation and we have whole careers created, fashioned, shaped by talent. Whole careers and whole fortunes shaped by the ta uh, you know, some particular accident. Similarly, the accident of having access to immense natural resources. This may not happen only to a person, but it may happen to a nation. A nation may have, after all, it's just accidental. Some nation may have access to some, whatever, some rare minerals which are used in some technology, or oil is a, is a very good example, or some precious metals which for some reason are given a great deal of value in our social system. So, 
You can see how these are pure, purely accidental circumstances, and yet we have structured a society which which depends so immensely on accidental circumstances. And this it has created an imbalance. This imbalance has enormous consequences which span centuries. So it becomes then a world that we create a world that is largely based on the accidental and the personal. And things like ownership and therefore division are built into the structure of this society. They are sort of inbuilt. And so is inequality. And things which add to this mix are our worship of success, our worship of power, our worship of property. In India, for example, we have all these. We have tremendous worship of success, tremendous worship of power, tremendous worship of property. Where exactly these have come from is hard to say. It's, we don't know whether we have had them for sort of all time, this kind of attitude to success and power, but we have really a, a I, I would almost call it a shameful attitude towards all these. We lose our entire sense of dignity uh, when we are faced with any of these, the way we behave. Why should it be so? Is, is really a, a question to be pondered. I'm going to quote something from Krishnaji now. We must distinguish between the personal and the individual. The personal is the accidental. And by the accidental, I mean the circumstances of birth, the environment in which we happen to have been brought up, with its nationalism, superstitions, class distinctions, and prejudices. The personal or accidental is but momentary, though that moment may last a lifetime. And as the present system of education is based on the personal, the accidental, the momentary, it leads to perversion of thought and the inculcation of self-defensive fears. So there's a very remarkable sentence in the middle of it where he says, the personal is but momentary, but that moment could last a lifetime. Quite an extraordinary observation. Why have we given so much importance to the personal and the accident? What is the reason for this? Or why should it be that you know something which is purely chance, someone happens to have more of something, someone else happens to have less of something, or someone is born in a particular country, why should why has it become such a major factor in what you experience for the rest of your life? We have created this, this kind of a setup. And if we have created it, there must be some, some reason that we have created it, some particular kind of a mindset that we have which has created it. And I think it's very important we identify what has made us give so much importance to this. Now I come to this theme of separateness, which is a very difficult notion. The whole question of the individual, the whole question of individuality, which we, we hold very dear to ourselves. We are not, we don't easily part with that notion of individuality. Deep down we feel that we are psychologically separate entities. We are absolutely convinced of this. And everything around us reinforces this feeling. The power structure, which the very sharp inequalities in power, the structure of property, how you own property, how you can get property from somebody else, the whole structure of inheritance, then the structure of nations, the legal structure, the whole society, the whole of society seems to be structure, structured around this idea that we are separate, that we are all separate individual beings. Now what does the individual in that sense mean? It means that you can sort of draw a line around yourself and you are like a separate entity, you are like an island within that. You may have connection with some other, other islands, but you are 
you have a, a distinctness. And this this matter we need to explore at, at depth. So how is this come about? Is this feeling of separateness? Is it actually a fact? This feeling that you are actually like a distinct island, or is it an illusion? This question actually, this just if you just take that sentence by itself, it's a major question in itself. How do you distinguish between a fact and an illusion? What do we mean by a fact? What do we mean by an illusion? Because we are surrounded by phenomena. There are so many things happening in our life. How do we make out what is a what is fact and what is illusion? So Krishna Ji has <coughs> has made a suggestion there that fact is that which is actually happening in front of us. It is it is real in the sense that it is we can see it happening. It's a it is it, we can touch it, we can smell it. There's a, a reality about it. An illusion is. When something has been created as a result of thought, as a result of our own, the structure that we have built within ourselves. Now the confusing part of this is that illusion can give rise to reality. Illusion can give rise, for example, when we, when we talk of a nation, a nation has been created by some illusory idea, but it, but it begins to have a great reality about it. It's a solid kind of an entity, the whole thing of a nation with its armaments and its clearly marked out boundary, its government, its national, its sense of itself, the sense of nationality and so on. So it becomes, so based on something which is very shaky, very illusory, something solid can be built. So how do you distinguish between something which looks completely solid and something which is of a different nature? It's not, it doesn't have this shaky foundation underneath it. I think it demands a tremendous amount of self-awareness on our part. There's no, probably there's no formula for it, but it, only after carefully searching through phenomena to see what lies underneath the things that we see around us. So I've also asked you, do we see the consequences of individuality? And behind this is the phenomenon of identification, which brings about separateness and the feeling of individuality. Now identification is with what? Again, the accident. The accident of being born in particular circumstances, we identify with that. We think it is me. That is just I may have been born in a particular kind of situation, but that is me. Identifying with the person, identifying with experience. And so we draw a boundary around ourselves. And as Christianity pointed out, when there's a boundary, the boundary means division. And division implies conflict. So therefore the question then becomes what is our responsibility when we see all this, when we see the inevitability of, of conflict as long as we are identifying with the person, as long as we are identifying with the, the particular, identifying with, with the accident. So you have quite, Christianity has asked this question, why do we give such importance to individuality? The separateness of the individual is not destroyed through his identification with the, collect with the collector or with an ideology. Substitution does not do away with the problem of separateness, nor can it be suppressed. Substitution and suppression may work for the time being, but separateness will erupt again more violently. Fear may temporarily push it into the background, but the problem is still there. And then the really key question which is asked here is, the problem is not how to get rid of separateness, but why each one of us gives so much importance to it. It's something which we can, we need to talk about. You are separate from me, that is a fact. But why do we give importance to this feeling of separateness with all its mischievous results? 
Though there is a great similarity between us all, yet we are dissimilar. And this dissimilarity gives each one the sense of importance in being separate. The separate family, the separate name, property, and the feeling of being a separate entity. This separateness, this sense of individuality, has caused enormous harm, and hence the desire for the collective, the sacrificing of the individual to the whole. Organized religions have tried to submit the will of the particular to that of the whole. There is some evidence to, su to suggest that long back in history, you see this phenomenon is not recent, it's not a 21st or 20th or 19th century phenomenon. Probably this phenomenon which is being pointed out here by Christianity may be 10 or 15,000 years old. It's been going on for a very, very long time. And apparently the early societies had found their own ways of dealing with this phenomenon of individuality and separateness, which may have been by our standards rather violent ways, but they found their own ways because they could they were aware of the harm that individuality brings about, what it does to the cohesion, cohesion, cohesion and cohesiveness of any group. And they found their, their own approaches. Many, many societies had worked out ways, I think, in, when you go back into prehistory. But those ways slowly got lost, perhaps, in various ways. And religions also have tried to do the same by trying through a system of, rather than just having some, some tradition, but through a system of belief, through a system of, of you know, a complex theology, you try to submit the will of the particular to that of the whole. So you try to push individuality out of the picture. Now I come to another theme, which is that of cooperation. What is cooperation? Again, the theme was dealt with yesterday. It came up in the, the question and answer session of Christianity. I think if I'm not mistaken, Siddharth also talked about it. What is cooperation? When people work together, there's a sense of working together. But what is the crucial part of cooperation? And where does the question of division, where div divisiveness, where does the question of separateness and individuality enter into this picture? By the way, I, I should add here before going on that this question of individuality and the personal and so on may seem a bit troublesome. Uh, we may say, but what becomes of the fact that I, I may like something, I may enjoy some particular subject, I may enjoy some particular kind of music, why shouldn't I like it? What's the harm? What? It, I don't think that. It will be, let's come back to that. In fact, that question may come right now. So, what is cooperation? We are working together. But throughout the world, you'll find that what dominates the sense of cooperation is working towards a goal. That goal becomes a very crucial and important part of it. And the goal turns out to have more vitality than the cooperative spirit. It turns out to have more vitality than the desire to actually work together. We get dominated and dazzled, you can say, by the, the attractiveness of the goal, of where you want to go. So the real, the heart of the, of the, the situation, the enterprise, becomes not working together, not the cooperative spirit, but some goal which you are trying to reach. But I think that is not cooperation at all. We have misled ourselves into thinking that that is cooperation. And as a result, we see today a vast pandemic of non-cooperation all over the world. So what comes in the way? What prevents cooperation? Again, that's a question for all of us. If we accept that, that what 
that the really important thing in cooperation is not the, the achievement, achieving the goal, but the kind of spirit that is that maintains between people, the cooperative spirit, the sense of working together. Because if that sense of is the sense is there, the goal may happen. You may you may actually do whatever you're trying to do, but that's not the the main thing. So is it assertion of identity? Is it assertion of status? Is it assertion of like and dislike? Assertion of the personal? Is it the domination by the personal? Is it an assertion of individuality? All these actually come in the way as long as the personal and the personal becomes the, what we we'll more familiarly call the vested interest. As long as that is operating, cooperation will not happen. Now the question which I asked a minute back comes in. Let's say I, I enjoy some particular kind of music. You enjoy some slightly different kind of music. You enjoy one particular kind of clothes. I enjoy something slightly different. Does this mean that is there, there's a difference between us? Does that mean that we cannot cooperate? No, it doesn't mean that at all. What, what is really the hot key in this statement is, in this matter is, that if we are really vitally interested in, in keeping that cooperative spirit alive, we will never let the personal intrude into the cooperative spirit. We can have our, our individual uh, you know, interests, a love of some subject, a love of some particular activity, but we should be extraordinarily uh, alert to whether it comes in the way of working together whether it has some influence on the cooperative spirit. And I think this is a, a rather critical point where the actual role played by the person in the cooperative spirit. Because the moment there is the assertion of individuality, the moment I assert that I want this, this is my, the way it should be, I don't care what, what you feel, I, this is the way it should be, that kind of a way of thinking, that is what perhaps destroys it. We, we are not able to move together. So cooperation really demands austerity. It is the austerity which is a refusal to let the personal influence the cooperative spirit. And that is, is I think, vital. And Krishnaji asked in one talk, is there at all a unifying factor among human beings? Is there anything which can hold us together? Because if no such factor can be found, then our divisions are going to inevitably destroy us. That means our divisions are going to have only, uh, we only have to sort of do our best. They are going to be there and having their, their corruptive influence on our work on our relationship, corrupting influence on society, and we just try to minimize their effects. Is that the approach where it is not working out as you can look at, you know, just see, look around the world? So Krishnaji has written out here, we ought to consider very seriously the capacity to work together, to work together with nature, with the living things of the earth and with other human beings. As social beings, we exist for ourselves. Our laws, our governments, our religions all emphasize the separateness of humanity. And this has developed into man against man. It is becoming more and more important, if we are to survive, that there be a spirit of cooperation with the universe, with all the things of the sea and earth. One can see in all social structures the destructive effect of fragmentation. Each one is striving for himself, his class, or his particular community. This division of beliefs, ideals, conclusions, and prejudices is preventing the spirit of cooperation from flowering. 
The economic and social structure intensifies exclusiveness, intensifies separateness, and this lack of cooperation ultimately brings about wars and the destruction of man. It is only during crises or disasters that we seem to come together, and when they are over, we are back to our old tradition. Isn't all isolation linked to a need for identification and fulfillment? Hasn't the importance of the self been cultivated by the opposition of the me and the you? Haven't all religions emphasized personal salvation, personal enlightenment, personal achievement? Has cooperation become impossible, uh, impossible because we have given such importance to talent, to specialization, to achievement, to success, which all emphasize separateness. So Krishna is asked all these questions and you can see the connection between this and the observation that he made earlier about the importance that we give to the accidental, the importance that we give to the personal. So we have allowed a few factors in life to have an outsize influence in life, enormous influence. Now I come to the last part of, the, of today's talk and I'm going to, this is a slightly longer part and I'm going to read out something also which is of a slightly, uh, some length. Because now the question is, what is the resolution of all this? We have the, we have the phenomenon of, of division. We have the film and we have traced it to the kind of importance that we give to individuality, to the personal, which in turn becomes the importance that we give to the accidental and to factors of that kind. So something which is which ought to have this momentary significance turns out to have enormous significance in life spanning centuries. So, what is the resolution of all this? It cannot be resolved by just by some legislative approach, some United Nations kind of thing within a, within a country, outside or beyond countries, nothing, nothing seems to have that, that ability, that, that reach. So Krishnaji has suggested that the only thing that is going to help us is to actually understand what, what is the purpose of life itself. Can we be grounded and moored with something that is actually, that is real? Can we, can we find for ourselves what is actually the heart of, of life, what is life all about? Because if we know if we have a sense of that, if we have an understanding of that, then we will never get deceived by this. The illusion of the, that can be caused by the accident. We will never give importance to that because it is a superficial thing, it is but a momentary thing. So, so this question he comes to through a consideration of energy. So first of all, what is the kind of energy that we have in life? And he himself has observed that there are two kinds of energy. One is this, which is the energy of desire, the energy of ambition, wanting something, or the energy of conflict. When you when you're in conflict, you, you're filled with anger, rage, you want to destroy it, this energy of hate. Or then there is the energy of identification. When you identify with something, when you have pride in something, it seems to give you a certain kind of an energy. Or identification with the symbol, identification with a particular kind of a memory or experience. Or the energy of division, one thing versus another. The energy of authority and power. The energy of fear. Fear and the self-protection which come out, which comes out of fear. Then we have the energy of ideas, the energy of the intellect, or the, and the energy of the center. 
And then there's the energy of will. When you, when you impose your will on something, you want to twist somebody, force somebody into doing something, or you have a clash within yourself. You want to force, you know, put a harsh discipline on yourself and crush out a certain element in yourself. There is a certain energy which comes out from that. It's the clash of the opposites. Krishnaji calls it the energy of friction. And it is this energy that has largely built the world of reality. If you consider, go back to the, the first slide that I showed, first few slides, the energy of the industrial revolution, which has had such immense consequences over the world, the energy of the colonial expansions, what kind of energy that must have gone into all these, these expeditions which went around all over the world and colonized some distant country and imposed through force, impose your own religion, impose your own ideas, your own ideas of how society should be. So this energy has shaped the world in extraordinarily uh, you know, massive ways. And it's also this energy which has brought about immense suffering because wars, the desire to subjugate another country to your will, to your ideology, or, you know, so all, if you look at the various things that have been sketched on this, on this one slide, you find it, it, it describes a huge amount of history. You take the whole communist revolution of Russia, for example, 1917, the kind of energy which possessed the, the people, or the energy of the French Revolution, the, the kind of consequences which flowed from that. So when there is opposition, when there is desire, when there is ambition, when there is conflict, when there is identification, every one of these brings about a certain kind of energy. So this is all one kind of energy, which Christianity calls the energy of friction. And he says the energy created through conflict is destructive. It's the energy that is created through struggle and battle, and it produces violence, hysteria and neurotic actions. But interestingly, such energy is also seen, widely seen as the source of creativity, which is why we seem to be very fond of it. Yesterday Siddhartha mentioned Gronowski. He has written a famous book called The Ascent of Man, which has also been made into a TV series, very powerful series. And there's a remarkable statement that he made, makes in that series, in that book. He says, the most powerful drive in the ascent of man is pleasure in his own skin. It's an extremely insightful statement. The greatest drive in the ascent of man is the pleasure that you feel in your own skin. And this perhaps lies behind the whole uh, scientific revolution, all the things that have happened over the past several hundred years. So it's a, it's a certain drive, and so, but it is also, it is the energy of friction. It is not some other kind of energy. And the energy of friction invariably creates in its wake disorder and fragmentation. It leaves behind a, a mark because it is essentially a, an energy of opposition. So perhaps deep down we would like that state of affairs to continue. So Krishnaji asks now, is there an action which is something different? Is there an energy which is some other, some other kind of energy? So one asks, is there an action which is whole, not fragmentary? In that action, there is no regret, no sense of fulfillment, no sense of frustration. Is there such an action? Because that is what we are asking all our life. Because whatever we do brings a certain pain, a certain confusion, or a certain reward. And in the pursuit of that reward, we create more division. So it is natural and logical to ask, is there an action not born out of the movement of thought? In other words, an action not born 
from the energy of friction, the energy of desire, or to state it another way, is there another kind of energy which will solve the problem of relationship, the problem of death, the whole human existence with all its complex problems? Is there another kind of energy that will bring humans, human beings together? To discover the truth of this question requires great attention, great quietness inwardly, great seriousness and intensity. So, there is such an energy. It is not a mythical thing. So I've written out here, surely yes. And the energy and clarity that come about when one sees a fact as a fact. I don't know, I'm sure we have all noticed this something this phenomenon, that when you see something very, very clearly, it brings a tremendous amount of energy into you. And this energy does not, is not the energy of friction. When there is the austerity of listening, the austerity of cooperation with life. And he writes here, the action of perception is total, non-fragmentary, and is healthy, sane. It brings about intense care and responsibility. That is the way to live, seeing, acting, seeing all the time. I cannot see if there is an observer different from the observed. The observer is the observed. But that's a point which may be slightly, we'll go into it separately, maybe in this question answer. So now at this point, I just break this, um, this and read out something else to you. I hope I can find it. Kept it open. Oops. Yeah, yeah. So I think you can see the text, we read it together. May I go into something which may appear to be different, but it is not. We need energy. We have energy. A physical energy, emotional energy, the energy of hate, the energy of lust, and the energy of great passion. And there is also the energy of great tension, which is brought about through a sense of frustration, division, and a lack of fulfillment. I do not know if you have not noticed this in yourself. As one gets older, the body becomes rather worn out. Disease, old age pain and all the rest of it begins and the energy races away and most of our energy is the product of conflict I am, I should be so this is the observer and the observer the fight, the aggressive desire to continue in that direction you have noticed all this and the energy that is brought about through an ideal through a commitment to that ideal the whole communist world is based on that from the beginning of Lenin till now Destroy people by the million to get what you think is right. And that gives one tremendous energy. Like the saint dedicated to an ideal, to a picture, to an imagination, to a formula. It does breed extraordinary energy. The idealists have an extraordinary energy. In any form of specialization, energy is required. The more you specialize, the more energy you have, discarding all other forms of energy. This is what you see not only in oneself but also outside. <clears throat> Thought creates its own energy, which is what is happening in the Western world. To produce one of those marvelous machines as a submarine, one must have tremendous cooperation, energy, and that energy is brought about through an idea. Idea is organized thought. I hope you are following all this. And this kind of energy is always, in the deep sense of that word, destructive, because it is divisive. Now is there an energy which is not destructive, which is not divisive, which is not mechanical? So I am asking myself and you, is there an energy which is not based on an idea, commitment to an ideology, an energy which is not dependent on attachment, whether it is to furniture or an ideal or a person? You are following all this? Is there an energy which is not in any way involved in the field of time as thought and movement, right? What are we going to find out? 
Do you understand my inquiry? Life is action, the very living. All relationship is action, movement and action. Action is movement. And that movement is based on thought at present political, religious, social, economic, and moral relativism, which is rampant in the world now. All that is based on thought, which is divisive, and therefore contradictory, and breeding more misery. And is there an action totally unrelated to all that? To find out, one must have energy, not mere intellectual energy with all its accumulated, educated knowledge. It is not the intellectual energy, nor emotional energy which is recognizable by thought. Therefore, it is still part of thought. So is there an energy which can come about so as to bring up, so as to bring about a total transformation in the very process of the mind? You understand? Our minds are educated in so many ways, in excellent ways on the foundation of thought. And that thought has its own energy. And in action, that energy does breed a great deal of mischief and confusion. That is clear. And in inquiring, if there is an action which is not based on the movement of thought, to inquire into that very deeply, you need a great deal of energy. Not the energy of trying to find an end, not the energy that you have when you are moving in a particular direction, but the energy that can change the content of consciousness. And he comes, he points out that it is only the religious mind that has the answer to this, that can find such an energy. A religious mind is a mind that is alone. There is a difference between loneliness and aloneness. You cannot come to this aloneness if you have not understood completely the extraordinary nature of loneliness and gone through it. If you have not understood it completely, tasted it, smelt it, been familiar with it, been in complete contact with it, had never a moment to avoid it, been completely related to it, not verbally but actually, the word loneliness is not the fact. But what most of us are frightened of is the word, not the fact. Because the word separates the thought from the fact. So you have to understand the whole structure of the word and how we are slaves to words. All this demands tremendous energy. A religious mind is not the mind that escapes, that avoids the word and becomes simple outwardly. The inward simplicity is much more demanding, much more austere. It has no outward show. And the religious mind has this inward understanding. I am talking of the austerity that comes with self-knowing. And that is much more austere because that demands precision, that demands reasoning, not fragmentary thinking. That demands constant watchfulness of every thought, of every feeling, to be totally aware so that there is a total action, not fragmentary action. Bureaucratic at one level, but superstitious, ugly, brutal, <coughs> stupid at another level. Running to the temple because someone is dying or crying, or because one wants more money. So a religious mind is a mind that is completely alone. Aloneness is not isolation. It is a state of cooperation. You ca cannot cooperate if you are not alone. Generally, you cooperate only when there is a reward of punishment, when you are getting something and you want to do something together under an authority, under the umbrella of ideas. But that is not cooperation. Cooperation comes when you are alone, when there is a sense of complete aloneness, which is the outcome, a natural outcome of a mind that has no escapes, no fear, no authority, and has understood this whole problem of energy. Then it is in a state of cooperation. So I close this and come back to the so I am nearly at the end and I have taken I know extra time so pardon me for that and he adds out here the word religion means gathering together all energy at all levels physical, moral, spiritual gathering all this energy which will bring about great attention in that attention there is no frontier to me that is the meaning of the word religion the gathering of total energy to understand what thought cannot possibly capture. It is that quality of attention that regenerates man, that brings about real transformation with regard to his conduct, behavior, and the whole way of relationship. 
So I have come to the end of my presentation. The last two slides I have moved away. I have written out here. I have shown this slide the other day also. You know, just the, uh, yesterday this question was asked, what is the motive which will make us get into the whole stream of self-understanding? And look at this quote, only a happy man can bring about a new social order, but he is not happy who is identified with an ideology or belief, or who is lost in any social or individual activity. Happiness is not an end in itself. It is not a remembrance. It comes into being with truth, with the understanding of what it is. Only when the mind is free from its own projections can there be happiness. I think this is a very important point. This stanza came up in the song that we sang this morning, the Kabir song, Mati Kahe Kumaharko, where in the middle he says, uh, what is that line? I'll read it out. He says, Dukh mein suviran sab kare, sukh mein kare na koi, koi. Jo sukh mein suviran kare, to dukh koi, kahe koi. I think it's important that, that we don't proceed along this path in frustration and unhappiness. Because then we look for a problem to solve and our whole approach changes. And I think what is pointed out in this little passage is that. So let me end with another very beautiful quote which I often like to show in such occasions. Have you ever noticed a tree standing naked against the sky? How beautiful it is. All its branches are outlined and in its nakedness there is a poem, there is a song. Every leaf is gone and it is waiting for the spring. When the spring comes, it again fills the tree with the music of many leaves, which in due season fall and are blown away. And that is the way of life. I think it is fitting that this comes at the end, because this also is about change. And it is change that is part of the natural rhythm of life, not change brought about through the energy of, of friction, the energy of wanting to possess or conquer, or the energy of wanting to escape from something. It is energy which comes about through some mysterious natural cycle which we don't know much about. And I think there is great beauty in becoming aware of that. So I think, I'm sorry I took very much more time than I should have. And I may take more also. <laughs> because I have one more thing to share, but only if there is time at the end of the question answers. Do you have any anything to
when there is what he calls the observer and the observed, when there is an image within me and I am hoping to, to mold myself according to that particular image, according to a particular pattern. All that is the energy of will, to try to force yourself to do something, to force you or force yourself or force somebody else to do something. It's, it's much the same thing. So the energy of friction is, is what is very common in the world. It's, by and large, we are aware only of the energy of friction. We may have very little awareness of any other kind of energy, which perhaps comes into being only at moments when there is tremendous clarity, when we have seen something truly, that something is exactly in a particular way. When you really understand something, there is instantly great energy in that. So when you see something about yourself, that brings about energy. And there is no, then there is no will involved. There is no desire to move in a particular change, a particular direction. It brings about its own action, whatever that action is. Different kinds, and 
to have a movement which will try to annul that obviously it has a certain social value so we need not uh, we need not uh, discount that it has a certain value but we cannot stay at that level because that is not it it may be necessary but it is not the answer to life because all such movements have their own consequences and for example let's take the freedom movement there was tremendous energy and at the end of it one whole one whole group got expelled from the country you might say but what happened after that the people who took over from them were probably no different from the people who were there before that so it, it seems to have only very limited significance when you resist something and produce something new as a, as a result of that um, it's like an armed revolution. You may temporarily get rid of something, but contained in that very action is the possibility that the same thing is going to come up again after a while. Because if there is violence imminent, that's the difficulty, I think. So unless that question of the religious contact, the energy of religious inquiry is, is tapped into, I think this, we cannot really answer this question. We cannot ignore the fact that, that you see, when we are all this, this thing that you just asked, the energy of resistance and so on, movements to, to, to deal with injustice, which are all of that type, it's all on a certain plane. And maybe the answer to life is not, does not lie in that plane at all. It may, we might have to step out of it altogether, which can only come about through our own exploration, our own experimentation, our own contact with with an element which is not, which doesn't come out of of our own thinking. In fact, the question can be asked: Is there anything sacred in life? And how is there any possibility of contact with, with something sacred? You can't manufacture it out of your own mind. How, how, where does it come from? What, what kind of uh, setting can possibly bring us into contact with anything which has not come out of, which is not man-made, thought made? Good morning, sir. Mm. Yes. My, my question relates to, sir, the separateness and the division. So, uh, we, you talked at length about the division between brought about by the society and culture, I don't think. But uh, my question is, sir, that is there a division that evolution has brought division in consciousness? And uh, what bearing it has if there is such a division on the social and cultural input division that divides man into man? And not how do we heal it, but where do we heal it? I mean, that healing, if it is to take place, it, uh, has it to take place just right now, right here in me? Or do I have to collect lots of data first and then go after the solution or healing? Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understood what you said, but division, I don't think that nature has brought about the kind of division that we are talking about. Because nature seems to have its own rhythm, its own order, as so many people have, have remarked and written about in Christianity certainly. Nature, the order of nature seems to be of a different kind altogether. The differences that you see, whether you have prey and predator and all that kind of thing, it, uh, it may look when you are seeing, when you are looking at it, it may look violent, it may look like it is a contradiction of the harmony of nature, but actually it may not be. It is part of the of a certain order which we are perhaps not fully aware of. I think the, the, the difference is that that action does not come out of a self-image. It does not, it is part of a certain rhythm. It's part of a certain process, a natural process. But, so there is no question of something which is illusory happening out there. 
But when when we have introduced opposites, when we have introduced, for example, will. Now let's say the question of will. I want to change myself in a particular way. I have created a picture of what I want to become, and I have created a picture of what I am. Now, where is that a real thing? Is this distinction which I have made in myself is it a real thing, or is it illusory? <coughs> it is really illusory. It is not based. It's not a real thing at all. And I think in nature you don't find such that kind of phenomenon. To the best of our understanding, we don't have any such any parallel to that in nature. So though you may have uh, apparent opposites like man, woman, and so on, or different kinds of uh, different kinds of tendencies in our consciousness, they are not necessarily of this kind. So maybe we can oh yes. Yeah, I was uh, struck by the words of uh, action. Uh, action which brings about intense care and responsibility. I mean, that is like the ultimate action. Uh, but I would like you to explain more uh, about action not based on the movement of thought. Like, thought is uh, something which we <coughs> sometimes cannot even control. It's there, guiding us all the time. It's there, based on conditioning. Well, it's so the it's action not based on It's the continuation of the same thing because thought, an essential nature of thought is that it is the activity of the brain and the brain is always in a problem solving mode. It always creates a certain object and it separates itself from that. That is part of its problem solving activity. It can do it, it is successful because it has taken that step. It has separated itself, it can then apply its analytical skills on, on that. Now that approach is fine in any technological kind of situation. When you try to solve an engineering problem of why a car is behaving in a particular way, why a computer is behaving in a particular way. But the moment we bring it into the into the human being, to the psychological realm or into the social realm, that does not, that same situation, that same kind of a thinking doesn't seem to apply because you can't separate that thing from yourself. So thought only furthers a certain complication because it is always trying to separate itself and it is introducing will and this kind of separation into its action. So in, in trying, so perhaps that applies to the question that you asked about resistance movements also. It may have its place, a certain limited place, but we must recognize that it's never more than a limited place. It cannot be more than that. Because it does not touch, it, it is not of that kind which does not leave a trace behind. You know, yesterday Krishna talked about right action, which is right under all circumstances, right under in any environment. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Thanks for the uh, nice intellectual uh, discussion on two kinds of energy. Uh, the first one you call, uh, or the Krishna Muthi call, I have not read it, uh, the energy of fiction. And the second one is energy of perception. So, uh, I think it's, uh, one is the negative energy and one is the positive energy. So, we have bifurcated energies in two things. But the negative or positive is, must be like a 99 or something like that. Uh, I have heard somewhere uh, that uh, there is a only energy and uh, that energy only transforms from one form to another. So, what's your take on that? Because if we uh, again, as you have said that uh, energies cannot be uh, intellectually classified into various kinds of energy and all. So, uh, what's your take on uh, the, the transformation of the energy actually? Or uh, the transformation of, yes, energy. Yes, energy can transform, that is very clear. 
and that can that is true of the energy of friction, and it is also true of the other energy that we are talking about. They are both they both have a, the capacity to move, to change things, the capacity to to mold things in, in a move things in a particular direction. They have that. It is the very nature of energy. Uh, so you see it happening in in technology, in machinery. You see it happening in a religious setting also in the, when you're talking of the other thing. I was, uh, I was asking about, uh, is it not that the same energy, that is the energy of friction, that transforms into the energy of perception? Well, that's, it doesn't matter. Why? Let's not ask a question of that kind. It's not necessary to ask that question. I think, let's actually explore this phenomenon for ourselves rather than trying to answer that question. Because you know, it's a premature thing to answer that question. Maybe in the end we will find that energy is energy and has taken different forms. But we are not at that point right now. Good morning. Good morning, sir. So the question is, uh, there is this uh, mm -hmm. creation like uh, writing poetry or uh, building on some mathematical algorithm. So, would that be an energy of friction? Like rehashing old ideas or building on existing knowledge base? Or would it be that energy of clarity, the energy of uh, knowing, which is a uh, simple continuous tense of actually doing the process? So, that what my question is that act of creation. Is it the energy of friction or is it the energy of knowing? As in writing poetry or, or a new mathematical postulate or a new formula? No, I have understood your question. I think it's a valid question. I think one would have to be in very close contact with oneself to be able to answer that, to know exactly in what manner something has come forth from you. Unless one has that sense, you won't, you won't actually be able to answer it. There's, there's no reason really why it should be a, an example of, of destructive energy. It may be a, an actual expression of, of, uh, of uh, creativity, of, of having seen something. When you actually see something, it will express itself in some way or the other. I think the really important thing is, it has, if it has come forth from some scene, from some actual observation, and has just taken a certain form after that, then it is, it is not the energy of fiction in that case. It is not, there is no opposition in that. There is no sense that it is trying to, uh, you know, that destructive quality. Perhaps we'll stop now. If you are, if you have the patience, I will Hello. read out something for you, and then we'll yeah, go for tea. Yeah, I ask you only yes. two questions, very briefly. One of the questions is first: What is the core teaching of Krishna Muti? What is the core teaching? Core teaching of Krishna Muti. And another question is that Krishna Muti has made: To live with death all the time. And one of the statements of there that without attempt to live your life in a timeless silence, please clarify. I think that question is, I, sh I shouldn't be answering that question, it's not something which I can answer. But Krishnadi has talked about this in so many ways, what his teaching is all about, to understand the limitation of thought to understand what is the purpose of life. In fact, it may come out, let me read out something to you, if you don't mind, if you have the patience for it. We will do you. Yes. Is that all right? I'll read out something for you and then we'll stop after that. It may answer the very question that you're asking. So look at this title. If man does not seek truth, this energy becomes destructive. And he says, what is this energy we all have? This energy is thinking, feeling. 
disinterest, enthusiasm, greed, passion, lust, ambition, hate, painting pictures, inventing machines, building bridges, making roads, cultivating the fields, playing games, writing poems, singing, dancing, going to the temple, worshipping. These are all expressions of energy. And energy also creates illusion, mischief, misery. The very finest and most destructive qualities are equally the expressions of human energy. What is energy for? Is it the purpose of energy to make war? Is it to invent jet planes and other machines? To pursue some guru? To pass examinations? To have children? To worry endlessly over problems? Or can energy be used in a different way so that all our activities have significance in relation to something which transcends them all? This is a very significant state. Surely if the human mind, which is capable of such astonishing energy, is not seeking reality or God, then every expression of its energy becomes a means of destruction and misery. To seek reality requires immense energy. And if man is not doing that, he dissipates his energy in ways which create mischief. And therefore society has to control him. You see, man is energy. And if man does not seek truth, this energy becomes destructive. Therefore society controls and shapes the individual which smothers this energy. That is what has happened to people all over the world. And perhaps you have noticed another interesting and very simple fact. The moment you really want to do something, you have the energy to do it. What happens when you are keen to play a game? You immediately have energy, have you not? In the search for reality, energy creates its own discipline. So students as well as teachers must work together to bring about the release of this tremendous energy to find reality, God or truth. In your very seeking of truth, there will be discipline and then you will be a real human being, a complete individual. Why is it that you are always being told what to do, what you must do and what you must not do? Surely it is because your parents and teachers, like the rest of society, have not perceived that man exists for only one purpose, which is to find reality or God. If even a small group of educators were to understand and give their whole attention to that search, they would create a new kind of education and a different society altogether. Don't you notice how little energy most people have? They are slowly dying even when their bodies are not yet old. Why? Because they have been beaten into submission. You see, without understanding its fundamental purpose, which is to find the extraordinary thing called the mind, which has the capacity to create atomic submarines and jet planes, which can write the most amazing poetry and prose, which can make the world so beautiful and also destroy the world. Without understanding its fundamental purpose, which is to find truth or God, this energy becomes destructive. And then society says we must shape and control the energy of the illusion. So it seems to me that the function of education is to bring about a release of energy in the pursuit of goodness, truth or God, which in turn makes the individual a true human being and therefore the right kind of citizen. Unless each one of you is so educated that when you leave school and go out into the world, you are full of vitality and intelligence, full of abounding energy to find out what is true, you will merely be absorbed by society. You will be smothered, destroyed, miserably unhappy for the rest of your life. As a river creates the banks which hold it, so the energy which seeks truth creates its own discipline without any form of imposition. And as the river finds the sea, so that energy finds its own freedom.